we've been very fortunate in uh, planning this uh, time together to have had the, uh, the advice of uh, Connie Rice and the Advancement Project who have been partners in this work. And uh, when we were thinking about how best to close out our time together, uh, I'm not sure quite who it was, but someone came up with the uh, very good idea about how, how about a conversation uh, between uh, the New York City Police Commissioner, Bill Bratton, uh, and Ms. Rice. Uh, and that's about to happen. So this is a rare uh, privilege, I think, for all of us to listen to two individuals uh, come at these issues from very different perspectives, uh, with deep experience uh, in the field, uh, who have a story to tell about Los Angeles, which um, I think some people in the room know it firsthand, uh, others uh, know it by reputation, and uh, some have actually studied and written books about it. It's a very important story, I think, for the country. Uh, so we're uh, delighted that uh, Commissioner Bratton uh, and Ms. Rice have agreed to do this. Let me just talk a bit about the, the format and the way ahead so that we know uh, what the ground rules are here. Um, uh, they've agreed to talk for about half an hour or so. Maybe they'll get really going and it'll be 35 minutes or so. Uh, they have agreed to set aside maybe five minutes or maybe a little more uh, afterwards if there are some questions. And uh, we will do that as well. Uh, our promise to you is to get you out at 5.30. So you see my constraints and I have to offer my 30 minute closing remarks summary in that time as well. <laughs> but I'm going to offer very brief closing remarks uh, just to say thank you uh, at, s at some greater length. Who do you want to have up here? Ron. Ron? Come here. Yes, you, Ron. <laughs> um, so the only thing I'm going to say before turning the mic over to them is that we, have, we asked Connie whether she would, in essence, interview Bill. And that's sort of an interesting challenge uh, because you know, who does the interview, who starts, and who tells the story. Uh, but uh, Connie uh, has a long-standing engagement, as you know, with issues of uh, race and civil rights uh, in the police department. And I didn't get her permission to tell this story. So here's the story I love uh, about Connie Rice. Her f maybe first meeting, or, or after uh, Commissioner Bratton had been named chief in police, she walks up to him at a social event or a welcome home or wel welcome, home, welcome to LA reception, she puts out her hand and says, I'm Connie Rice, I'm the person who's gonna sue you the most. <laughs> something like that. That's a true story. Yeah, and, uh, and the chief then said something like, let's talk. <laughs> so, so that's the beginning of a long story. Let me say as a New Yorker and somebody who used to work for Commissioner Bratton uh, and has a great affection for the PD and for our city, uh, just how fortunate I think we are to have his uh, steady hand on a difficult uh, journey that we always go through in New York. Policing is always fraught with uh, difficult issues uh, and that it's uh, great to have him back in the uh, Commissioner's office. That's a personal editorial statement. So uh, without any further ado, we'll turn it over to the two of you. I'm going to be the timekeeper. You got uh, 30, 35 minutes. Tell the LA story and anything else you want to talk about. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Are you ready? Okay. Good, 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 good. Um, Chief, it's great to see you. Always great to see you, Connie. On Thank you. Coast. Even when I'm suing him, he was always happy to see me. Actually, I don't think you ever did. I know. You persuaded me to put my complaints away and come inside the department, and I did. And you gave me a parking space and a badge, and I haven't left. With no gun. With no gun. <laughs> Wouldn't give me a gun. Um, what I'd like to do, Chief, is go over some primordial questions about policing. I'm not going to do the fluff. If we have time at the end, we can do some fun questions. But I wanted to get to some of the more serious ones, because we're not going to get a chance to do this very often. For me, there is a clash between broken windows, the philosophy, and the values of public trust policing, where the community feels like the police are part of them, where they feel that police are there for them, and they trust them. When you have, if broken windows isn't done right, because I know it can be done right, but if it isn't done right, what you have is you have police arresting people for marijuana uh, offenses. You have them being, you have people being arrested for everything, uh, just, you know, selling cigarettes and things like that. 
And it's tiny, tiny infractions. And I know the theory is if you send the message that small infractions will not be tolerated, therefore the big ones will not be tolerated. So if you enforce the small infractions, you'll keep the community safer. I get that. But there's also a real breach of trust. And in LA, where we're doing public trust policing with the Community Safety Partnership Police, our, 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 our premier public trust policing unit, um, there are no arrests for marijuana. There are no arrests for selling cigarettes. There are no tiny arrests. You only arrest for the violent offenses because they're building trust. Trust is what they're after. Can you reconcile broken windows with trust? Certainly, they're uh, very compatible, actually, as if you think uh, broken windows are quality of life policing, which is actually the more appropriate term. Uh, how do we come to enforce quality of life offenses and fractions? Uh, we come to it because the public asks us to come and deal with it. We're just uh, in the process of finishing a very comprehensive study in the NYPD about where are we making those arrests, where are we issuing those summonses, where are we responding. And if you look at the map of the city of New York, that where the 311 calls are, where the 911 calls are, are also where the source of those calls is. And source of those calls is violations that are occurring in neighborhoods where people are calling us to do something about it. So it's actually a reciprocation of the trust uh, that the public has that if they call, we will come, and more importantly, that we'll do something. I think where the issue becomes problematic is what we do when we get there. That, uh, and this is the idea of what is the appropriate level of uh, uh, interruption. Is it a, uh, you know, verbal? Is it of necessity uh, a summons? Might it be of necessity an arrest? The uh, incredible discretionary powers that police officers and the police are given, and whether it was Boston, L.A., or New York, uh, the issues to me are always the same where the problem occurs is in that trying to determine what is the appropriate level of uh, interaction or interference. It's like a doctor, I oftentimes use the medical comparison. You're sick, you go to a doctor, and you expect that he's gonna be able to prescribe a medicine to deal with your illness. But if he overprescribes, then it's not going to work. He's gonna create another illness. And I think in some respects what we're uh, running up against is this uh, over-application of medicine, too much medicine for the illness that we're responding or dealing with. But uh, trying to find that appropriate balance is what it's all about. So in your mind, your officers have enough training to be able to exercise that discretion. Is that right? Some of them do. Some of them don't. Uh, we have recently gone through a number of years in New York where uh, most recent graduates from the police academy, arguably the most recently trained, were then put into some of the toughest environments in the city uh, environments where they were poorly supervised, poorly mentored, and um, if they made a mistake, if they made an arrest instead of something a summons could have answered or a, a verbal warning, there was actually nobody there to correct that uh, uh, mistake, if you will. And the whole stop, question, frisk controversy that uh, has consumed this city for the last three or four years a lot of that, I think, had to do with the idea of uh, inappropriate use of police powers in very distressed neighborhoods. And if those young men and women had been put into those neighborhoods in those numbers with better supervision, better partners, I think a lot of the controversy that arose about the sheer number of stops, the inappropriate nature of the stops, would have been addressed because possibly there would have been fewer stops in that the, hopefully the senior officers would have been a correct stops that were not done with reasonable suspicion. At the same time, uh, this is where administrations have to take responsibility for uh, what the officers are responding to. They respond to the leadership, and if the leadership is looking 
as seems to have been the case in this city for a number of years, raw numbers. You've got the belief that more stops led to more crime reduction when in fact it did not necessarily have that impact. Instead it led to a lot more citizen dissatisfaction. And so that's the balance that as a police leader you're constantly trying to find. Chief, when I looked at the stop and frisk numbers here in New York, I was flabbergasted. How, can you explain the mentality, the mindset of a department that looks at numbers like that and doesn't see anything wrong? I mean, how in the world could NYPD think that it's okay to stop almost every single black man in Harlem two and three times? I mean, I, it's mind boggling at one level, and yet the department felt like it was perfectly good policing. What went wrong? Well, I can't speak for the previous administration. They have to speak for themselves, and they uh, spoke loud and clear that they felt that was an appropriate policing tool. Um, the mayor I work for campaigned on the belief that it was inappropriate, both in its volume, but also in its practice, the sense that a lot of those stops were not based on the appropriate level of reasonable suspicion. Uh, and he was elected uh, in part on that position. Uh, he hired me on the shared belief that I had with him that there was too much of it and that a lot of it probably was not being done appropriately. Um, even before our arrival, the uh, backlash against it had begun to take effect so that even uh, as he was elected and I was appointed as police commissioner, the number of stops had dropped off dramatically and now those stops are down by you know, close to 90% uh, from what they were. Uh, yet the city crime rate continues to go down. It's down another 4% this year. Robberies this year at a historical all-time low. Murders are trending to be at a historical all-time low. Uh, to read the tabloids in the city, you'd think that Armageddon had arrived with the increase in shootings. Total number of increase in shootings this year over last year is, as of this morning, 50 which amounts to a 6.8% increase in shootings from last year. Last year was the lowest year in the history of the city in terms of numbers of shootings, modern history. This year is the second lowest year. So in effect, we have a city that's becoming even safer and a city that's much less intrusive into the day-to-day uh, -day lives of particularly young minority males, black and Latino. Uh, and also, interestingly enough, the stops that are being conducted that the percentage of stops that result in an arrest or a uh, recovery of a weapon, gun, and knife for that in, in which that was the reason for the stop in the first place has risen uh, dramatically so that more of the stops are resulting in more police action, meaning that the reasonable suspicion was probably appropriate in the first place. So. Uh, Again, there was a difference between the former mayor and police commissioner and the current mayor and police commissioner in um, an appreciation for stop, question, and frisk in terms of what it could be used for or how it should be used. So they have to speak for themselves. I can uh, speak for myself that uh, I think it's at an appropriate level at this time because what is the intent? The intent is to have a safer city, but also to have as less interference with people's lives as, uh, as you can. And we're at that point. Okay. I grew up on Air Force bases. We moved 17 times in 22 years. My mother is a genius at making you think that you're supposed to move and that it's normal. But in every single place that we move, my mother would take my two brothers and she would take them to the police, the military police on base, and she would say, these are my sons. They are straight-A students. Do not kill them. There are a lot of black mothers who feel they need to do that. And it's a rather shocking notion. We did it everywhere we moved because my mom knew what could happen if white military police saw two little black boys in the officers, because we were officers' children, in the officers' section of the base where most black people did not belong in a lot of people's minds. Do police 
understand that feeling of black mothers, that they have to warn their children. And what goes through your mind when you hear that? Well, I think many do, uh, but the duality of the reality of their world is that in this city, for example, that we have one of the lowest ratios of use of force, if not the lowest of any major city in America. Uh, this year, so far this year, that there have been uh, eight lives taken by uh, police in the course of their performance of duties. That at the same time that uh, we've had over 200 murders in the city, uh, probably 70 some odd percent of them have been young black men, principally murdered by other young black men. So in dealing with this issue, I think we need to focus certainly on the continuing emphasis on police practices that tend to alienate or create fear in the minority communities, particularly the black community, about police activity and its potential risk to young black men in terms of violence, losing a life, which happens very, very infrequently. Uh, but at the same time, we also still have to continue to focus on what brings so much attention of police into minority neighborhoods, and it's violence. And violence that is taking uh, incredible numbers of lives in that community. So the issue I think that police officers face who work those streets is having difficulty understanding whether there doesn't appear to be a similar concern or outrage about, in the case of New York City, the loss of several lives at the hands of police, several of which are questionable, some are in response to being assaulted, and the loss of several hundred lives that are having even more impactful uh, impact on the community. So it's that trying to equate the two that I think that creates some of the, the difficulty. And I think the challenge for us is how do we continue to work to reduce violence, but do it in a way that we build up legitimacy, build up uh, support for procedural justice. And I think that's the challenge for our police. Can it be done? I think it can. I think our experience in Los Angeles was a reinforcement of that, that there was an ability to significantly reduced violence that was taking so many young lives, over 1,200 lives a few years ago in LA, down to this year, I think, once again, under 300. And at the same time, reducing the number of lives that are taken by police, which are proportionally much smaller impact. So there's the, there's the, the balance we're trying to find, that the uh, idea that uh, we can affect positively both if we get it right. And by getting it right, I'm talking about the embrace of legitimacy, constitutional procedures, uh, policing, and embrace of procedural justice. Thank you. Right before LAPD Chief Beck said, announced that he would not impound trucks, for example, of immigrants, and then he decided that it was unfair because immigrants can't have driver's licenses, that it was unfair to penalize them for not being able to comply with a law that they were unable to comply with. We're a community of immigrants. Many of our cities, LA for example, is like 40%. Some communities are 40% immigrants. Some are majority immigrants. And I remember telling Chief Beck that there was a point in American history when my family was hunted. It was hunted by slave, escaped slave posses. It was hunted by a, a number of entities attached to slavery. And that no community can be safe if it has people who are hunted in it. And so when I look at some of the Central American immigrant communities and some of the Mexican American communities, some of the Cambodian American communities, where there are a lot of immigrants, I really feel the fear. I go into those communities, it's wall-to-wall -wall fear. That's not healthy. What can police do to lower that fear we're nowhere near building trust with immigrants, forget trust. 
it's about lowering the fear to a level where we could even begin to have a conversation with them and maybe eventually years from now getting trust. But I don't understand how we're going to police communities where trust isn't possible because of the fear. Actually, I think uh, you're wrong there, Connie. I think that there's been a lot of progress made in what? that <laughs> That's right. What? That uh, L.A., uh, ironically, uh, uh, under uh, Darrell Gates, uh, uh, during his time, the special order 40, which uh, really precluded L.A. police officers from uh, action uh, directed against uh, the immigrant population, the illegal Im immigrant population, based solely on their immigrant status that uh, LA actually has taken a leadership role there, as has the NYPD. Uh, during my time as police chief, when Arnold Schwarzenegger was uh, basically uh, denying the ability of illegal immigrants to apply for a license under the red herring that uh, he was concerned about terrorist activity among that population. And as I said, as chief of police at that time, any terrorist that wants to give me a set of fingerprints a photograph and a current residence, come on down, I'll sign you up. That, uh, you know, so the idea of giving illegal immigrants driver's licenses, which would then allow them to take driver training, get insurance, and then reduce significantly my hit and run where people flee the scene because they're worried about being arrested, not only for the offense, but then being deported for being here illegally. So by police chiefs and enlightened mayors taking positions that uh, we will not police against their status, but still police behavior. Whether you're here legally or illegally, we have an expectation you're going to obey the law. And what draws our attention to you is when you're not obeying the law. But when our attention is drawn to you, your immigrant status should not be of concern to us. So we have a lot of movement in that direction. Uh, in two of the major cities of the country, certainly New York and L.A., which I can speak to, so I think we're making progress there. Where we're limited, unfortunately, as you well know, is uh, in Washington with, unfortunately, the Congress of the United States and the log jam that exists in that uh, part of the country. So uh, here in New York, we're uh, in process of implementing a municipal ID card, which will be uh, in the country's largest uh, city of significant advantage to hundreds of thousands of people who are here either illegally or here legally but don't have documentation as to their identification. So there's a lot of progress being made there. Do you have immigrants on your pol uh, uh, in your staff who help you reach out to those communities? Well, certainly. That uh, One of the, uh, I think, unfortunately, best, best kept secrets, as it was in L.A., as is the case here, is how much outreach goes on in the NYPD in terms of the community councils, the various uh, groups that I interact with that are up to my office, that whether it's out of the Muslim community with the many concerns that they have, or the various uh, uh, immigrant communities that uh, uh, this is an incredible city for the populations that are here. Uh, know the department is not only reactive, but incredibly proactive in those reach outs. And um, a lot of that's unheralded, a lot of it's unknown. Uh, for example, in this city this past summer, 1,200 inner city kids, uh, we ran a six week effectively uh, youth academy for 1,200 inner city kids where every day we mentored them, we entertained them, we educated them, we worked with them. And uh, the graduation of those young people was phenomenal to see where their parents would come to the graduation and celebrate that they had given their children over and entrusted them to the NYPD for 12 weeks and were very pleased with kids staying out of trouble for the summer, very pleased with the educational experience, the, uh, uh, the, the, the physical uh, experience of the exercises that they engaged in. Uh, there's so much of that that's done that uh, is not known about, interestingly enough, except in the communities where it's being done. I wrote an editorial, the only editorial that's ever been rejected by the LA Times and the New York Times, but I wrote an editorial after, it was a little too long after the children started appearing on the border. I was so angry when I saw those children on the border because I knew why they were there. I didn't even need any other background. We have sent, the United States has deported 137,000 
lethally trained gang members into El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Those are teeny, teeny countries. Some of them are smaller than LA County. If you deport 137,000 gang members into any area, you're going to have a huge surge in violence and danger. So as far as I'm concerned, we endangered these children's neighborhoods with our deportation policies and our stupid prisons that are crimogenic, as Justice Kennedy described our prisons. I just love that we're crimogenic. We actually create crime with our prisons. It's so stupid. But with that, I felt that we were equitably stopped from deporting them back, that we had a moral obligation. We had endangered them with our deportation policies. And because we had endangered these children in their own neighborhoods, we now had an affirmative obligation to protect them here. And equitable estoppel just means you've got dirty hands and you don't have any right to make a claim. So what do you think we should do here? I mean, I, I strongly, and I, I know you're, he's always felt very free to disagree with me, as you can see, but it is just such a moral outrage to me that we would send these children back. They are refugees in my mind, and we endangered them. What should our policies be? We should, should we be, I think it's wrong to deport gang members back to a country that can't defend against them. Do you think that that had an impact on those countries the way I do, or do you think that it was a perfectly plausible way of getting rid of some troublemakers? And do you think that these kids should stay here? Well, the deportation of violent criminals back to their countries of origin, uh, I'm sorry, my obligation is to my community, Los Angeles, New York, uh, and if I don't have an ability to deal with them here, uh, I'm very supportive of sending them back uh, where they came from. Uh, that's the reality, that uh, do I want people being shot up on the streets of Los Angeles in my community in my country. Uh, so I don't have an answer for that, and I don't know that you do either. What are you going to do? Well, here's what I do have an answer for, Chief. No, let, me, let, me, let me finish in the We made them gang members. They didn't come here as gang members. They came here as children. Mm -hmm. They became gang members in the United States, and then we sent them back. That's the problem. That's the moral dilemma here for me. Well, some of them did. Some of them came in as gang members that uh, we can debate the numbers, but uh, the issue about the concern of the growth of the prison population, the growth of the prisons to deal with that, those violent gang members, that was some of the feeding mechanism. And I'm very supportive of the idea that there are many too many people in prison who shouldn't be there, particularly for drug-related offenses, nonviolent offenders. But uh, I'm sorry, there are people that need to be in prison, and some of them need to be there for the rest of their lives because they are, they're sociopaths, their violence levels are so intense. And many of the gang members that you've, you've talked about, the brutality of the gangs that you saw in Los Angeles, what are you going to do absent putting them in prison or in some instances back to their countries of origin that otherwise if we keep them here, we just keep growing the prisons here. So we're compounding the problem that you're trying to reduce. Uh, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you I have answers to some of the, the questions that you're asking because it's, I don't. Uh, it's. Uh, I think I have some answers to deal with the issues I face in Los Angeles and New York that the country is facing, support of uh, the idea of, as the studies that Jeremy and the, uh, is announcing this week, that uh, too many people in prison, let them out, get them into treatment. But when we speak about gang members, that uh, we're into a totally different world that, uh, uh, in terms of the violence levels that they engage in. And uh, some of these people have just lost to society. That's the reality of it. So we either keep them here in prison or we send them back where they came from. And uh, it is unfortunate those countries don't have the capability sometimes to, to deal with them. So there lies the dilemma. Do we, do we keep the problem? Do we ship it back? And uh, that's the whole issue we're dealing with right now with the federal government, local cities, municipalities, uh, where we're not supporting holding uh, uh, illegal immigrants beyond a certain point in time. Mm -hmm. Chief, let's talk about sex trafficking. About, I'm sorry? 
sex trafficking. Human trafficking, okay. I am the great granddaughter of slaves and slave owners, and I find it absolutely outrageous that in the 21st century we have slavery. When Elaine Jones, my boss at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, asked me, well, Connie, what do you think we ought to do next? I said, slavery. She thought I was joking. I wasn't. How in the world do we tackle this? Because, well, for example, there's a piece of it that I know we can tackle right away, which is most people don't know that 80% of the people who are enslaved, who are American citizens, are foster care kids. That's outrageous, and most of them are black. Most people don't know that American kids who are sex slaved are mainly foster care and mainly black. Ladies and gentlemen, we can fix that. I know exactly how to fix that, and we're going to have to get organized to do that. That's my next project. But for the international children, for the, for the children who are trafficked because the coyotes brought them up and they thought they were going to get a job and instead they're put into sla sex slavery or some other kind of trafficking, those children have no one to protect them, and they have no communities that will pick up the phone. How do we begin to organize immigrant communities to say to them, you have to help us save these children? If you see a casita, which is what they call a slave house, in East LA, pick up the phone. But they won't pick up the phone. They're afraid of the cartels. They're afraid that they'll get retaliated against. They don't trust LAPD or the sheriffs. So. What would you suggest that we begin to do here? I think that you've got to organize the community massively first so that they can begin to understand how to recognize a slave house, how to recognize the movements of the slavers, and organize the community to begin to pick up the phone to give early warning or, or warning or to just notification. And then you've got to train the police to work with immigrant communities, which we need to do anyway. How do police learn to work with immigrant communities, not just on the trafficking issues, but on a lot of other issues too? Because it seems to me that that's a huge hole in American policing. Well, I think that uh, is the African expression, it takes a village to raise a child. All of the issues you've raised uh, not necessarily solvable, but significantly capable of being fixed to a degree more than we're currently doing. And the idea of it takes a village to raise a child is the idea of collaboration coming together. So a lot of it begins with the building of a house, the first brick that's laid down. In Los Angeles, a lot of the improvement in relationships between police and the various minority communities, African American and Latino in that city, begin with the leadership in the department, leadership down into the police district level, so that uh, at your captain level, commander level in LA, here in New York, would be captain level, that people who really do believe that uh, cops can make a difference, police count, cops, uh, cops count, police matter. Uh, you have a, he's now a deputy chief, but was a captain during my time there in L.A., down in the 7-7, uh, uh, Captain Green, uh, then Commander Green, who made a comment that the, uh, the future is not in handcuffs. He got it. He was an L.A. cop that came up in the 80s in the worst of times, and he was probably one of the uh, cops that had the best arrest records and was uh, dealing with crime in the yeah, old fashioned he's way. Yeah, he's a shock, he used to be a shock and awe cop. I used to sue him every chance I got. Yeah. And... Uh, so that he understood as he progressed through the ranks that we couldn't keep doing the same old thing the same old way all the time and became very creative. I, I use his quote all the time because it was a, an extension of the quote that myself and Lee Barker used in L.A. that you can't arrest your way out of the problem. So in dealing with the issues of whether it's sex trafficking, the gangs you talked about, the violence, it really uh, it, it begins with a few people in the leadership who then are able to teach, inspire, and mentor. And I think LA has moved in that direction. I think uh, Gary McCarthy, who's here, my temporary working in Chicago, is certainly attempting to move his department in that direction. Certainly something I'm trying to do here. 
an organization we belong to, the Police Executive Research Forum, PERF, is really committed to that. Uh, we have gotten very good at reducing crime. We can never get rid of it all in the last 20 years. Uh, we need to take some of those lessons and apply them now to improving relations in an environment that's less crime-filled than it was 20 years ago, where we don't have to necessarily be as intrusive in what's seen as a negative way, going in and stopping everybody and frisking them and locking them all up, that we're doing a lot less of that you just have to look at my arrest numbers. You just have to look at uh, around the country. Uh, we're doing a lot less of that, fortunately. That gives us some breathing room to uh, to build those relationships. And, uh, for example, myself coming back from the NYPD, uh, I came back in at this juncture to deal with what I saw over the last several years, the uh, worsening of relationships in the city around the stop, question, and frisk issue, and feeling that what worked in L.A. would, in fact, work here. So a lot of the things we did in L.A. we're seeking to apply here. And uh, I think the good news is that what was going on in L.A. is going on in a lot of other American cities, a lot of like-minded, uh, progressive police chiefs working with progressive mayors. Okay. They've told me to give you one more question, but I'm going to give you two more. I'll talk fast in the response. The traffic's so bad out there, you might as well hang out here anyway. You're I not know. going anywhere uh, unless you're taking the subways, right. which I always encourage anyway. They are now very safe. <laughs> Chief, you know that I'm a female chauvinist. I love men, but I'm quite I clear. Did, I, did, I didn't know that. Yes, you did. You hide it very well. Yes, I know. Yes, I, I, I adore men, but I'm quite clear there's a superior gender and that I'm a member of it. And I have found that the best cops are women. Now, of course, you agree. I have to take exception to that. <laughs> I think, I think we have a shared uh, uh, platform there, men and women. <laughs> no, there's some wonderful male cops. But women, women officers are not as threatened. The ego... Uh, uh, are not as? Threatened. The ego doesn't get as involved, I have found. And the more women there are on a force, you know, the CSP force is just proportionately women, of course. They are amazing. And I'm, I'm just wondering, are, are, are women still applying to the departments, both LA and, and, and New York, in the same numbers? Are there increasing numbers? We're still not at parity with women. Not at parity. I think uh, in the NYPD, we have about 20% now. I think that was roughly the ratio in the LAPD when I was there. Uh, but I'll speak to that issue about women versus men that we are different, but in an organization, there tends oftentimes to be uh, conformity to the organization, male or female. And that's where the leadership issue comes in, that a woman can be just as abusive as a man, just as authoritative, just as assertive. Uh, so it's, this is where the importance of the training, the supervision, the mentoring, the guidance, comes in to take advantage of some of the natural um, uh, uh, things that a woman would possess that might be different than a man. But uh, I've found in policing that women can be just as brutal as police officers. They can be just as uh, abusive verbally, physically. Uh, it, and, and that's the reality because the human nature is to conform to the environment that you're in. And so I know certainly what I've sought to do with my times as a police leader and my, some of my contemporaries in the room, Dean Essman, Gary, and others, that is to create an environment uh, that is not abusive, that is not uh, overly assertive, that is not overly intrusive. And uh, to pick skilled people, male and female, who can flourish in that type of environment. Uh, not always easy, and uh, as a matter of fact, it, Five o'clock news on one of the TV stations tonight. They're playing a video of two female officers uh, who engage in a con con uh, conversation with an individual sitting on a stoop, and the way it's been described to me very quickly raised it into a uh, use of force that became very abusive. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of sitting here as you're raising the issue about how different women are from men that in this particular video, the way it's been described to me, which you can probably watch it on the 11 o'clock news tonight, that uh, you know, there's two female officers who, at least the way the lawsuit describes it, 
uh, were inappropriately assertive in their uh, act initial actions with this individual. So they started to behave like the men? Uh, that's the way it was described. <laughs> It's so I haven't, I haven't seen the video yet. I'll be seeing it as soon as I get back out to oh my vehicle. Oh dear, oh dear. One last question, Chief. No, I'm not gonna ask that one. Um, <laughs> what, what made you reach out to people like me when you were in LA? Why, you told me to come inside and when I came inside, he asked me to investigate the Rampart investigation, and that was a way of keeping me so busy that I couldn't sue him. <laughs> but it was very smart, because I got to interview about 700 officers in that 18 months. And, when, and I mean, I really interviewed them. And I kept them all anonymous per agreement, unless they agreed to be revealed. Police said to me, some horrendous things, but they were honest. And I appreciated the honesty. Things like, I tell lie after lie after lie, Connie. We all do. Uh, I tell so many lies, I don't know when I'm lying anymore. Or, Connie, I'm afraid of black people. I'm scared of blacks. Or, I, I mean, it was incredible, the honesty that they shared with me, and it gave me such incredible insight into their psyches and their mindset. And I could see the fear. I began to understand the fear. As a chief, what part of the training deals with that kind of mindset with people who've grown up in singular communities that are racially homogenous? They have no exposure to any other racial groups or linguistic groups or international groups, and they're scared of them. And then they pick up some of the old dinosaurs' attitudes of racism, and everybody has a lot of these attitudes. I'm not suggesting that only cops do, or only whites do, or only blacks do. Um, in LA, I've seen Mexican-American cops who can't stand Central Americans. I've seen African-Americans who hate all Mexicans, in quotes. I've seen white cops who hate anybody who isn't white. I've seen, <laughs> I mean, in, in LA and in New York, you can have it go any, any direction. Do you think the training that these cops go through deals with enough of this mindset stuff? Two thoughts there that uh, a significant part of my concern about the stop question risk operation impact program here in New York was that they took these uh, very young people, many of whom uh, came from communities that they did not have much exposure to, uh, people of color, if you will, and uh, certainly not exposure to uh, the crime situations they now found themselves in because they were assigned to the 10 busiest crime precincts in the city, all of which uh, are 90 percent or more minority. So they're starting off with a significant handicap. They're seeing things that they've never seen in their lives, seeing things committed by a population that they've had no interaction with. And so much of their interaction is with, in that community, the criminal population, because that's what they're being focused on. So that there's not an opportunity to uh, be exposed in the formulative stage of their career to the broader breadth of community. And they're also assigned with uh, so little supervision, so little guidance that no field training officers, one sergeant for every uh, 12 officers. Uh, it's like herding cats, if you will. So um, part of the resolution to what you're describing is how, in fact, one, we train them, but then how, when we put them out in the field, the experiences they have in the field. So the group of officers that just came out of the academy in this last class in New York are now out with closer supervision and mentoring that uh, for every 12 officers we hope to have a ratio of uh, not only a sergeant but several mentoring officers with them so that if they're making a mistake there's somebody there, a volunteer officer who's willing to correct them. Uh, the next class that graduates in January, uh, my intention is to take those 900 recruits and assign them to all 77 precincts in the city so that each precinct will get about 15 officers 
so that they'll be spread through the diversity of the city. And that will allow a lot more one-on-one -on -one partnering in the precincts, a lot more supervision, a lot more training opportunity. And as part of that, we're going to seek to identify over the next year or so uh, officers who will be trained as field training officers who want to serve as those mentoring officers. So then that early formulative stage of six months of very good training in the academy, but the more important portion that first year when they come out in the street, that they're getting exposure to communities, uh, the broad breadth of communities, the full range of police services where they're oftentimes helping people because under Operation Impact, the focus was stand on a corner and be suspicious of everybody and stop as many people as you can. And so it didn't give them an opportunity to get the full breadth of the police experience, which is meeting an awful lot of very good people, an awful lot of people who need your help and assistance, and you get a better understanding of the community you're trying to police rather than that narrow focus of go out there and basically just stop people or focus entirely on crime. Policing is not about crime all the time, as we know. It's a lot of other things that we provide. Yes, it's a lot of other things. Chief, it's always good to see you. Great to be seen. And Great to be uh, with you. we will uh, continue this discussion, and thank you for making yourself available. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. So we said uh, two things that are inconsistent with each other to you. One is we'd have you out at 530. And the other is there'd be 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, so with the commissioner's uh, allowance, if we could spend 10 minutes, do you have? Uh, yeah. If you feel so you have to leave, please do. We won't take offense. And yeah. I'm not going anywhere the traffic is. <laughs> okay. Uh, but but I think, I think the, the interaction would be, uh, would be valuable. Uh, all I would ask is if people have questions, they'd be questions and not statements, if you know what I mean. Sometimes people find this opportunity to just let it rip. Uh, and of course, they're, uh, be respectful and, and pointed, and it can be either to Ms. Rice or Commissioner Bratton, uh, and we're only gonna do uh, like two or three. So you, you were the first, uh, and you were the second, and I'll do Terrence's last. Okay, go ahead. Maybe, depends on the time. Let's, let's see how we do. Short uh, question, and uh, we'll try to, try to get them to make short answers. Right? And just identify yourself so you know where you're from. So I'm just going to repeat them because we don't have a roving mic, and, and you were very clever at getting in two questions. Let's not anyone else do that. Uh, the one was, how can we get more training? Is that a matter of money or time or what? And secondly, what could, what's the community side of this interaction? And I assume that's directed to the commissioner. Right? Okay. Good news here in New York uh, is that the mayor is very supportive of the idea of much more training for our police officers. Uh, NYPD is probably one of the most skilled in the country in terms of developing training skill sets, but uh, where we tend to fall down in certain areas is a lot of what we uh, train to are perishable skills or skills that if not refreshed under guidance or tutoring can become, become corrupted, if you will. So uh, we will be starting early next year a process where the approximately 22,000 officers out of our 35,000 were routinely on the streets, detectives, uniform that uh, we'll be putting together a three-day training course for supervisors, two days for police officers. That will be refresher training, particularly on the perishable skill areas of officer interaction with people, both verbally as well as physically, uh, the appropriate ways to engage in both of those activities. Uh, refresher training on the various laws that we operate under, uh, a whole variety of uh, training. and not just one time only, but going forward, structuring the department so that we can accommodate that level of in-service training each year. We train New York City police officers twice a year, two days a year, on the use of their firearms. That training has paid great dividends in that we use firearms less than just about any police department in America when you match up our size. 35,000 officers, we had about 100 instances last year where we used firearms 
and in the course of that use of firearms took relatively few lives versus the numbers we were taking years ago. So that training, that volume of training has paid off. But in the much larger area where we have to use force during the course of an arrest, uh, about every hundred arrests we use force on two occasions. And that's down from as recently as a few years ago, eight times out of a hundred. But the idea is that uh, we give no refresher training on that use of force during arrest. So for approximately 8,000 incidents, we give no refresher training. For 20 some odd incidents, we give two days of training. I think by giving refresher training, we'll be able to reduce those levels of force even further in terms of uh, making arrests or not even having to make those arrests in the first place by improving the verbal training skills where we can solve an issue verbally or maybe with a summons rather than going to the arrest situation, which results in the use of force. Well, Commissioner, I get to cut you off because I'm ma managing 10 minutes. There's a second question that I'm going to ask you just to think about, or maybe Ms. Rice wants to answer, which is what's, what, what do you want from the community? But let me make sure we get your question and just identify yourself. So the question is? Sure. My question is Thank you. Your approach uh, to your current administration, uh, the law enforcement presence in the city prior to your arrest, what changes have you made? Right. Yeah, we have uh, over 5,000 school agents and over 200 officers in, uh, routinely assigned to our schools, in addition, hundreds of other officers who are in and out of the schools for a variety of uh, issues. Uh, Good news is you might want to take a close look at what we're doing because the levels of arrest, the levels of interaction, summonses, et cetera, are down dramatically. The levels of violence are down even more dramatically in the city schools. And we've just completed a whole initiative that the mayor will be announcing within the next week or so that is a very comprehensive uh, review and implementation of even more strategies and initiatives to reduce the, 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 those already reduced levels of violence even more dramatically. So uh, in that area, the NYPD can take a lot of pride in having participated with the school system in significant reductions in the in negative interaction with the school student population. We've also just put all of our 5,000 agents through some additional several days of training in anticipation of the opening of schools. A lot of it keeps coming back to the issue of training, training and then supervision and collaboration. We're not doing this in a vacuum. We're working with the school department we're working with a lot of the health and human service agencies and having uh, some significant success here. The numbers are looking very promising here. So since I know that the next person I identified is also from the Open Society Foundation, as is you, as you are, Terrence, you're going to wait for a second. Do you work for the Open Society Foundation? Yeah. Good. You get to ask your questions. <laughs> They're just very sort of assertive people, right? Go ahead. Ms. Rice to start that? I think everybody understands what implicit bias is, overt bias and implicit bias. You have to train people. You have to train people to recognize their own biases. I certainly had to be trained to recognize mine. I know exactly what my biases are, and I know how to counteract them. But I had to embrace them first. And that's painful. It's painful to do. So it's specialized training. It's not training I would do or you would do, but there are, special, there are specialists who come in and you can take the IAT test. It'll tell you what your biases are. 
I have no biases in race, but in gender, I'm off the scales. I am, I am a female chauvinist. I just had to accept it. So I'm not proud of it. I'm a civil rights lawyer. I'm not supposed to have any biases. But I am a female, you know, I, I'm biased against men in a lot of ways. So I have to claim that and I have to compensate for it. I have to make sure that I'm doubly fair to men in my office and elsewhere. So you can receive training. I mean, it, it, it's like any other specialty. And I would suggest that people stop trying to pretend that we're all virgins and, and, and have no biases. Everybody has them. Everybody does. And you know some of them and you don't know others. So you may as well come to grips with it, get the training, compensate for your biases. And if you really have a bias that is so bad that it's prejudicial, you have to be taken out of the line of fire. You have to be taken out of that job. Commissioner, do you want to add to this before we get to the next question? Just quickly that uh, in, the, in the police profession, as police officers, uh, our principal responsibility is to enforce the law, but to do it constitutionally, can't break it to um, break the law, to enforce the law, do it respectfully, certainly. The whole concept, as we talked about, about uh, legitimacy and uh, procedural justice. And fortunately, in the area of concern that you have as it relates to undocumented uh, um, um, the, the immigrant population, the laws have been changing very dramatically and very rapidly that uh, in many communities around the country, Los Angeles and New York, I can speak to specifically as the two cities I've been privileged to lead the police organizations and I think they have very progressive laws to work within, very progressive laws to adhere to or enforce. And uh, uh, once again, it comes back to the issue of, of training, the issue of policies and procedures that are in compliance with the law, and then once again leadership also that uh, to ensure that uh, if abuses do occur that they are dealt with appropriately and effectively and that uh, uh, the idea is that the police department has to stay contemporary with the changing times. And I think uh, uh, fortunately in the major cities of this country that is, uh, has, that is and has been the case. So I, no, I know a number of people have questions and uh, we're going to break uh, in a couple of minutes and anyone who wants to come up and ask a question can do that, but for the public setting, let me just limit it to, to Donna Lieberman and Terrence Pitts. Quick questions and uh, hopefully quick, quick answers and identify yourself for the group. Uh, you get one, you get one out of it. Well, as I think you clearly understand, since the summons doesn't have a box to indicate the race of the individual that you're uh, citing, uh, it's a state summons that uh, that presently is not possible to do, uh, unlike the uh, the 250 form. Uh, I'm not averse to that. Uh, one of the ways that you build up community trust is through transparency, more openness of, as to your, the, uh, the statistics that you're compiling and that you're working with, and uh, you know so the potential resolution of that issue is to get the state to change the summons so that it would allow for that type of capturing of information. Terrence, uh, and then we'll, I'll, I'll give my 30 minute closing remarks. Yeah. Just, just, just speak, we're having a little trouble, everybody hearing, just, and you are from Open Society, right?
I'm actually not aware of what you're talking about that uh, in terms of I, I, can't, I can't speak to that, but I can speak to is that the mayor this summer that uh, in response to urging of uh, a variety of uh, uh, entities, myself included, uh, provided on uh, weekends in particular, keeping a lot of the community centers, the, uh, uh, the, the various recreational facilities open much later into the evening and uh, model after a program that was very successful in Los Angeles. Uh, in those centers, uh, I'm pleased to report over the course of the summer, it was very successful in that we had no significant uh, reporting of violence or uh, uh, activities of that type in those centers. Kept a lot of kids off the street, kept them in safe environments. So the specific issue you're talking about, I'd be very surprised in this administration if in fact those cuts are actually occurring. That uh, something that the mayor is very, very focused on in terms of particularly public housing. So I can't speak to it because it's the first I'm hearing of it, but I'd be very, very surprised if that was actually the case. Would you help him advocate for it to be kept open? Sorry. Would you help him advocate for those centers to well, be certainly kept we, open? Certainly, we, we're one of the principal advocates for keeping the uh, centers open on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights that uh, worked in Los Angeles and certainly worked for us this past uh, summer here in New York. Matter yeah. of fact, I was encouraging the mayor this morning when I met with him to actually take some credit for it that uh, we had a very successful summer. This, this, this August, uh, you wouldn't know this by reading the tabloids in this city, uh, but we had the fewest number of shootings in modern times in this city, 134 in the month of August. That's the lowest number of shootings in, since we've been keeping records. And uh, you wouldn't know that by reading the tabloids that talk about violent weekend, et cetera. They keep failing to report that uh, it's safer than it's ever been, for example. Uh, it just in the last 30 days, the percentage of shooting incidents increase has gone from 15% as of this morning. It was uh, down to 6.7% uh, increase in shooting. So we have a declining, but you're not going to read that in the tabloids, I can guarantee it. There's so much dislike by the owners of those two papers toward this mayor that I can guarantee for the four, next four years, you're never going to see a positive story about crime reduction in this city for that reason. So but he will help you advocate to keep those centers did, open. Did you notice that she if sealed the deal for you? If they're closing, I'd be amazed <laughs> if they're closing. Yeah, uh, right. So uh, we've been privileged, I think, to hear some of the most thoughtful uh, leaders on the issues of concern to this uh, gathering over the last uh, two days uh, as a perfect way of closing out. So they have done my 30 minutes, uh, given us a lot to think about. Uh, those of you who have questions that we couldn't uh, address publicly, I do feel an obligation to let people leave without uh, um, uh, sort of stepping out in front of everybody else. Please feel free to come up uh, and talk to Ms. Rice or Commissioner Bratton. But please join me in thanking the organizers of the conference for bringing us together, uh, Connie Rice, Bill Bratton, for giving us a lot to think about and some inspiration, actually. And uh, thank you all for coming uh, to John Jay. Thanks. Thank you.